confirmed. Ident details SSS Esperanto ocean seeding ship. So the crew is exploring a derelict ship on an ocean planet. They got five million years of evolution in three solar years. So the ocean should be filled with life, but it isn't. You saying there's some huge damn fish out there, aren't you? Some kind of gigantic, weird, prehistoric leviathan who's porked this way through this entire ocean. However, they do find evidence of the crew. One man who shot himself in the head. One man who hanged himself. Male Oriental. Clearly, he committed seppuku. I like the implication that he just has a katana with him all the time, just in case of a seppuku emergency. That's what Japanese people do, right? And also a fish that apparently closed up its gills and suffocated itself. Damn fool! He committed suicide. He committed suicide. He committed suicide, and the fish committed suicide. There's some kind of link here that I can't quite remember. Oh, cat! You almost sounded smart for a second. But then Lister finds some venom that Crichton thinks came from some kind of giant squid, and they've all been exposed to it. It secretes a venom, a poison, possibly even a hallucinogenic, which dysfunctions its prey by inducing despair. It's only a small dose, but they hightail it out of there. But we may find that we do experience much <laughs> of despair and anguish. I don't seem to be affected. It's true, I don't think anyone's ever truly loved me in my entire life. <laughs> this is like Saturday night at the Wayne Wall. It has to be the strong one. I mean, you guys would just fall apart. Unfortunately, the despair squid, as they've been calling it, is coming after them. Directly above you, about 2,000 fathoms and diving. Oh, thanks a lot, Rimmon. You couldn't have lied? I was lying. It's only 1,000 fathoms. He thinks we're either a threat, food, or a mate. He's gonna either kill us, eat us, or hump us. They try to get away, but. Jesus! Starbug crashes and explodes. So, it turns out that Red Dwarf was a total immersion video game all this time, not unlike Better Than Life. Welcome back to reality. And they've been in it so long, they've forgotten who they are and what their real lives are like. How's that for a mindfuck? And they look a bit different in reality than they did in the game. I'm not a hologram. I'm half human. What the hell's happened to my teeth? I love this guy. How you feeling? Bit wonky? Apparently the squid was a pretty easy boss, according to him. You swonk, use the laser cannons on the crash. What's it? Uh, Esperanto. That's how you get out of it. Who's always playing this today? Me. Did you get Kachansky? Wow, we haven't heard anything about Kachansky in a while. What's the objective of the game for Lister, you swamp? Which one was Rimmer? Me. Uh, how long did it take you to suss him out then? It has memory arrays and was programmed to act like a complete swamp. So no one suspects he was on a secret mission to destroy Red Dwarf in order to guide Lister to his destiny as creator of the second universe. That would have been one hell of a twist. I want to see that Red Dwarf. Lister, the ultimate atheist, turns out in fact to be God. How was Lister the ultimate atheist? I thought he was a pantheist, just not a frying pantheist. Come to think of it, I guess the two aren't mutually exclusive. Blimey, I wonder you only scored 4%. <laughs> yeah, what a bunch of twonks. So now they're in the recovery room. Since they don't remember anything, they basically have to start over and rebuild their lives. Either running away from God knows what, or we've got nothing worth living for in the first place. Which one's Dwayne Dibley? <laughs> no, 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 please not. I don't want to be Dwayne Dibley. And the fandom still hasn't recovered. White socks, nylon shirt, plastic sandals, cardigan. It doesn't make sense. Rimmer actually makes a good point. Doesn't it just make total sense that this hapless creature would give his buck teeth to play someone like the cat in a computer game? Wouldn't we all want to be the cat? Crichton, open the next one. Anyway, Crichton starts over by deciding he's not going to take any orders from Rimmer. Almost certainly. Whoever I am, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to take any crap from whoever you are. All I said was open the next one. Yeah, but you pointed and snapped when you said it like you always do in giving an order. Who am I? It turns out that he's a detective in the cybernautics department. What's my name? Jake? Jake Bullet. That sounds like the kind of hard-living flatfoot who gets the job done by cutting corners and bucking authority. And if those pen pushers up at City Hall don't like it, well, they can park their overpaid fat asses on this mid-digit, swivel till they squeal like pigs on a honeymoon. Settle down there, Criters. Perhaps the cybernautics division is in charge of traffic control, and you just happen to have a rather silly macho name. Cat's still trying to cope. Meanwhile, they pick up the next case. No photograph. Name? Billy Doyle. Rimmer has decided that it's Lister's. Well, that's a name that came from the wrong side of the tracks, isn't it? <sighs> it's yours. <laughs> what? Of course, Rimmer's tune changes now. Bill. 
William Doyle. Good old Bill Doyle. You know, that sounds like a hell of a good name to me. Well, what puzzles me slightly is what a man of such undoubted good breeding would be doing wearing a coat that smells like an elderly male yak has taken a leak in both the pockets. Oh my god. My name's Billy Doyle and my cologne is eau de yak urine. All that's left is Lister. Look at my gear. It turns out that he has a lot of expensive stuff in a limo waiting in the garage. Well, clearly you were privy to all the breaks and advantages that life denied poor old William Doyle here. Uh, William? Meet your brother, Sebastian. Anyway, they're leaving, despite their memories not having returned yet. Lister takes a peek at how the next game is going. Hey, it's Red Dwarf USA! They quickly find out that Earth is ruled over by a fascist regime. In the parking lot, they're confronted by a cop who is about to kill them for allowing a little girl to get away with an apple. Bullet cybernautics. It's traffic control. When he recognizes Lister. M many, many apologies, Sir Vodokono. Had I known it was you, I... It turns out that Lister is head of the police. To purify democracy. The girl appears again and the cop... Halt! ...ends up being the one who gets shot. <laughs> by Crichton. I killed him. Oops, it turns out they're hallucinating. Let's get out of here. In the car! You know how when you were a kid and you and your friends would set up four chairs and pretend you were in a vehicle? Uh-oh, speed bumps. That's basically what this is. That bridge, you think we can make it? It's raising! <laughs> also hilarious outtake time. You'll notice that Chris Barry isn't moving very much in the final version. He's afraid of falling again. Best car chase scene ever. I killed a human. Back in the hallucination, Crichton is about to shoot himself in the head. I'm on the run from the fascist police with a murderer and a mass murderer and a man in a bright nylon shirt. And now they all realize that they hate their lives and want to end it. But Crichton only has one bullet. But Holly manages to get through to Crichton, somewhat. I have a strange compulsion to pick up this fire extinguisher and twist the release wheel. Yeah, that wouldn't work too well. The bullet would only go through Crichton's head and go over everyone else's. Maybe it would graze Rimmer and Cat. But it doesn't matter because Holly finally does get through to them just in the nick of time. Welcome back to reality. You had a group hallucination brought on by the ink from the despair squid. The valve she had Crichton turn turned out to be a mood stabilizer. Of course. The hallucinations were designed to induce despair. Crichton explains how the despair squid's ink was affecting everyone. Rimmer, who was nearly happy to find out he wasn't Rimmer, suddenly couldn't blame his shortcomings on his parents because Lister, who is rich and successful, was his half-brother. Though, come to think of it in real life, Rimmer's brothers are all successful and he's still able to blame his parents. Oh well. The cat doesn't really need to be explained. Of course, Lister, who, despite his other faults, always prides himself on being a decent person. He may not take care of himself very well, but he'd never hurt another person. So he became someone who was responsible for a fascist regime and a lot of deaths. And in Crichton's case... You, it was taking a human life? Precisely. I'm not doing Dipley! <laughs> I am Rimmer. <laughs> I'm afraid so. In the meantime, Holly took care of the despair squid. There's enough fried calamari out there to feed the whole of Italy. We end on one of Lister's speeches. The evolutionary process threw up a life form so much stronger and more deadly than any other species. Damn near wiped out everything on the entire planet. It sounds rather reminiscent of a species sitting not a million miles away from me now. Right, <laughs> <laughs> no one likes a smart aleck android. And so ends Back to Reality. So the last couple episodes haven't been terribly deep, relying mostly on comedy, which is okay, but I feel that this show is at its best when it's revealing its hidden depths, and this was one of those episodes. It's always interesting seeing alternate versions of characters in a way that gives us insight into why the main characters are who they are. And even though the idea of the despair squid was mostly played for laughs, it's kind of an interesting concept. There are chemicals in your brain that affect your mood, an imbalance can cause depression, the idea of a creature whose venom can affect that is pretty interesting and doesn't seem all that out there for such a highly evolved creature. Of course, this episode marks the first appearance of Dwayne Dibley. I think I'll save most of my thoughts on him for when I do my cat special. But the short version is that I 
don't really get why he's so hyped up. I mean, I don't dislike him or anything, I just don't really get why the fans go totally bonkers whenever he shows up. Other than that, Lister is rocking this hairstyle. Seriously, he pulls off that style pretty well. I think I recall reading somewhere that Craig Charles is biracial, and I didn't realize before this episode just how Caucasian he can look. It's interesting how a change in hairstyle can totally transform a person. I don't think there's much else to say about this episode that I haven't already. It was a nice little mindfuck and a great way to end Season 5. Next up is, yes I'm going to talk about it, Red Dwarf USA. I don't know how soon it'll be done since I haven't decided on how in-depth it'll be, but it'll be the next Red Dwarf video. See you then. Don't fish swim south for the winter? I know that's birds, sir. <laughs> birds swim south for the winter? How do they breathe?